Hello and welcome to Cherry Red TV. My name is Ian McNay and today's guest has two names and two sides to his career, at least two sides, Louis Philippe and Philippe Eau Claire. And it's interesting because um, I've known Louis now for many years because he was signed to uh, L Records, which was part of Cherry Red, and made several albums with us over that time. And I've also known another side of, of Louis Stroke, Philippe, the last few years, which is uh, his football side. He's a very committed Arsenal fan and also commentates and writes for radio and TV in France. So we'll start by talking about your music career. Mm. So at what age did you first get interested in music? Um, interested in music very, very, very early on, but uh, the idea of actually... I wouldn't say making a career, but starting writing songs and performing and things like that. Um, uh, I think quite late compared to other people. I think I, I really got into it when uh, I was already at university. So I was in my very early 20s and bought myself a, a Fender jazz uh, bass. Same one as uh, Brian Wilson had uh, on the one oh, of the... On a, absolutely. Yeah. On uh, Fender Precision. What did I say Fender Jazz? But it's a Fender Precision, the famous black and white one. And I started immediately, uh, well, trying to pick up tunes, got a guitar, and found myself almost immediately, rather than, than try and learn from methods or with teachers, trying to write songs immediately. But that was my first, right. uh, my first inkling. So I immediately wanted to, to write songs and to transfer the music I could hear in my head to something with my very, very, uh, with my concrete fingers. So that's, that's when I, I started. It's a bit unusual, shall we say, because I wasn't really in a, in, in a rock and roll band or in a punk band or anything like that. I was following the scene very, very closely, uh, in Paris, that is. And, um, but I very quickly came to the um, absolute conviction that I had to to write songs. That was the, my way through music, even though technically I was absolutely appalling. I had a decent voice already, I knew that. And so I started writing songs around 1982, 1983. And um, through sheer luck, uh, these songs uh, actually arrived on the desk of somebody you know, I believe, Michel Duval. Absolutely. It was the founder, one of the founders of Disco du Crépuscule and Factory Benelux, which at the time was, I would say, quite an avant-garde uh, independent label with, of, of great repute, actually, which had acts uh, uh, like Toxido Moon, uh, Isabelle Antenna, <coughs> and, and many, many on the other I mean, Win Mertens, for example. And through a friend of mine, um, a collection of demos that I had done with a, uh, with a friend, actually, on my parents' farm in Normandy, uh, in a fridge, in one of those big French cool, you know, we oh, used right. to, yeah, we used to, to keep our apples and pears in because, you know, I was obsessed with Phil Spector and girl bands and I wanted to have this big reverb on things. And so we recorded in there and the tapes got onto Michel Duvin's desk, who played them to his wife, who really loved them and said, you should do something with this boy. And then literally something like six months after I had really started to write songs, Michel Duval got in touch with me and asked oh. me if I wanted a contract with Les Disques du Crépuscule which is a bit unhopeful, but at the time I thought, yeah, absolutely natural. You I'm thought this is easy. This yeah, it's easy, this business. <laughs> you know, they, they talk about these people who have to send their demos to so-and-so and so-and-so yeah. so before they get any interest, but it happened very, very quickly. And um, I, I went to Brussels. At the time I was in between, I would say not two careers, but two lives, because I was studying to be a philosophy teacher. And, but I wasn't too sure that what I was, really wanted to do to become a teacher, a university teacher, and to have my life sort of... Um, well, straight jacketed into that particular direction. So the music helped me to get out of this particular track. And Michel told me, come and live in Brussels. We have a job for you there if you want to. So I found myself as a cook in a, a brasserie which was owned by, by the record company on the Grand Place. And again, I thought this is the way things go. This is natural. And then I started, you know, writing there, working there, uh, and released a, a, a few few records. Um, which again felt very natural with one uh, exception maybe is the fact that I discovered what proper studio environment was and I discovered it with um, somebody called Andy Paley who happened to be the um, uh, producer at the time of Jonathan Richmond and the Modern Lovers oh, right. and yeah. the Ramones Rock and Roll High School, things like that right. and who would later on become uh, Brian Wilson's collaborator on his first 
proper comeback album and actually played with him on a number of uh, 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 on a number of later records. And so I had this incredible incredible stroke of luck that the first person who produced me and actually the only time I had a proper producer in the studio uh, with all excuses to Richard Preston, a completely different relationship, but the, the, the only time that I had really somebody directing me from A to Z was somebody who happened to be probably the biggest Beach Boys fan in the whole world, who could play me all these bootlegs and smile tapes and perform the songs on the piano. And so it started, it was an ideal start, and I, I was really, this is the moment I thought, oh, this is really quite special what's happening here. And I was literally, uh, I was very, very emotional uh, at the end of that particular session. That's why I thought, there's no way I can ever do anything else but carrying on writing songs and recording them. I have found my world, found the studio. Yeah, the studio, the, the, the recording studio. Yes. I, felt, I, feel, I felt so at ease. Even though, you know, I'm, I, I was not, again, technically very accomplished uh, at all. But I, I immediately had this, this conviction that this was the place where I belonged, where I felt um, completely myself. Um, and also felt a, a kinship with with the process of recording it, it agreed to my sort of logical way of of, of thinking uh, the way that you were putting a record together and um, so I would say yeah that was really absolutely crucial this this very first record actually yeah this is the border boys was it? this is the border boys yes and and uh, uh, we did one EP um, and uh, then I changed my name again uh, to the Arcadians. Yes. Um, the reason was that I still had the dream of being of having a band, uh, and I had a band of sorts uh, in Paris and in Brussels, but I couldn't cope with the band politics at all. And I also realized I was I was the leader because not only did I sing, I also played the guitar, I wrote the songs, and actually arranged the songs as well. And so I had to give instructions to people all the time, and I found it quite difficult within the structure of a band, where people are supposed to be on an equal footing, more or less. Yes. And I realized very quickly I wasn't tailored for that. I had huge problems trying to keep everybody happy. And I decided to go alone, and so I took a, a band name, <laughs> The Arcadians, yes. which was actually disguising the fact that I was now on my own doing the songs that I had been writing, and that 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 was for me the best way to 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 work at this particular point in time did the songwriting come easy come easy to you um probably the most natural thing um when i was you know i i did what probably all self-taught musicians do is that you buy yourself a, a songbook of and it would be you know a Burt Bacharach songbook or it would be a beach boy songbook or it would be a Liber and Stoller songbook and i would go through the guitar uh, the guitar chord, you know, and, and try to replicate them. And I realized that when I was starting, I don't know, I would play something um, by, you know, composition of Bird Backrack. Of course, it was well beyond my capacities at the time to play that. But I would play one chord and think, oh, that's nice. And then suddenly I was starting to hear something completely different from what I was supposed to be playing. And so I realized there's all this wonderful world of, of harmonies and, and chord progressions. And every time I discovered a new one, melodic ideas would start jumping. And because very often, uh, it's it's at the very beginning of your career that you you are blessed with the freshest melodic ideas where you don't have any preconceived ideas about yes. what it should sound like, uh, what is expected, and then afterwards, after three four years maybe, this 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 kind of freshness is on the wane a little bit, and you reconquer it much later. Actually, this, well that's my own personal experience. To you have to reconquer it by knowing what you're doing with much, a much greater physicality, organicity, as you were, as, as you were, um, and, and to try to re, you know, re reconquer again what you have at the very beginning, which is just this will to, to give something and to let things out. And so that was, yeah, it, at the beginning it was extraordinarily easy. I was writing songs day and night and uh, making sure I had always, you know, 10, 15 songs ready when I wanted to record some that I always had something for yeah. later. So it, it was not a drug, because I was, it wasn't, it wasn't making me you know, high or anything. It was very hard work. But at the same time, it was an absolute necessity. If I picked an instrument, if I sat at the piano, picked a guitar, I had to write a song. It's interesting the different ways that people write, because some people have to be in like an almost a disciplined environment. They have to mm -hmm. sit down and close the door and switch the phone off and say, right, for the next three or four hours, I'm writing a song. But with you, it just seemed it'd be almost a spontaneous thing and the ideas were coming it, it's on the, all the time yeah so that you could write uh when you're walking down the street you can write when you're 
uh, in, in, in the bus or anything. When I think of one of the songs that I, I'm, I'm really very proud of, uh, which is a song which was released on, on their records, but a song I wrote for, for the King of Luxembourg. Right. It's called The Rubin's Room. Right. And I wrote that song. I remember I went to a meeting with, with Michael Way in the old Kensington uh, offices. Yeah. Days of Splendor. And uh, <laughs> Michael and I spoke about a list of titles, and I saw that one. I thought, that's a great title. I love that. And I started to hear the song literally as I was walking down and going, going down Westbourne Grove, and by the time I had reached the uh, tube station that I think at Bayswater I went to, yeah. the songs was, I wouldn't really? say written, but the tune was there, the harmonies were there. It's just, it was, it was extraordinary. So where does it come from? It sounds like it comes from... <laughs> well, I don't, know. I don't know. Yes. I, mean, I, I won't go all mystical about it. It's just, I, I think it's something that you, you work on, and I, uh, uh, there are ways, as you say, you can sit at the piano, decide I'm going to write a song, or you're in a hotel room, you're touring, and some people pick a guitar and say, well, I'm going to write a song like now. Uh, and uh, at times I work like this. I try to keep to a, a strict discipline. Uh, but generally it is more to, to refine a particular song, to go through a chord progression or, or a string arrangement or a melody line. I'm not completely... So it's more a, a work of redoing, re reshaping, finishing the article. Otherwise, very often it's just something that pops in. Uh, yeah. I don't know, and it's walking is very good for that. You know, you, you, you hit a particular beat, walk slowly, or so as I get older, maybe the tempo of the songs <laughs> get a little bit slower as well. And suddenly, you, you, I don't know, things will just start popping in, or I will just... And, and I, I've worked an awful lot on that, probably more than anything, which is try and hear things there before I, I go to a guitar or before I go to a piano. So try, try really to imagine the music. Right. And how it comes, I, I don't know. I don't think I'm particularly special. I think most people have got disability. It's, I think it's a, really a question of tuning in, so to speak. Yeah. And do you actually write music itself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, do, yeah. 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 So um, I'm, I'm, I'm self-taught, but I, I spent a great deal of time. I had to, actually, because very early on, because when I only stayed two years with Disco du Crépuscule before I was taken under the tutelage of Air Records and Cherry Red in London, yeah. And almost as soon as I arrived, actually, the first thing I did when I arrived in London was to work with Simon Turner on, on the first King of Luxembourg album. Uh, actually, fantastic memory, I have to say. Great, tremendous fun. Yeah. Um, and I had to do some arranging work almost immediate, immediately. Nobody asked me, can you write music? But I was asked, can you do a bit of this, a bit, a bit of that? And when it came to do my first solo album for, for, for L, uh, which was an appointment with Venus in 86, I believe, uh, I had to write my own strings arrangements. So I, I crammed in an awful lot of work, basically with orchestration treaties, uh, by listening to classical music and reading the scores and trying painfully to, to get this technique in, in, in my head and, and still still working on it, I would say, almost every day. So you mentioned Michael Way and L Records. How did you first meet Mike? I met Mike for the first time at his flat in Barnes, I think, at the time that he was working for for Blanco, if I'm not mistaken. So this is Blanco Negro, which was the Warners funded operation. That's right, yeah. yes. Yeah. And um, at the time, uh, Mike had, he had heard the Arcadians album, which had been published by Crepuscule Records. I think I'm getting my facts right here. And I went to London and I met him at his, at his flat and he explained to me all these extraordinary ideas he had for, for Blanco Negro and would I like to be part of it? Mm. To which I said, of course, I'd be delighted because very early on we realized that not only we had, um, uh, well, our musical tastes were, were quite similar and they were at the time very exotic uh, and strange musical tastes considering, you know, the, this particular period of, of English independent music which was very grey, yeah. the shoegazers, the Thatcher years and what we were thinking of were people uh, like, uh, I don't know, Les Baxter or precisely Burt Bacharach. Um, and and many others, which at the time, you know, people hadn't got a clue, um, could have the least interest, you know, uh, Esquivel, who had heard of Esquivel in, in 1985, 86, and the answer, people thought it was records for their parents or something like that, and that's the music we loved, and Mediterranean music as well, even Frank Zappa. Yes. Um, so I thought, oh, I, I really can talk with this, this gentleman, and also we both had an absolute fascination for people like Orson Welles, M uh, Michael Powell and, and Emmerich Pressburger, I mean, so much in common that uh, we had to, to, to be together in, in one guise or another. And when Mike c 
came back within the Cherry Red family and, and started L Records. Uh, obviously, I was, I think, probably the third person uh, to come on the label, maybe, I think, the third or fourth. I think Carl Blake was the first. Uh, Nick Curry was probably the second. Simon, and okay. I think I just came after that at the same right. time as Anthony Adverse. Yes. So yeah. very early on in, in, in the history of the, of the label. We should explain, to put it in sequence, for people who don't know the full history of Trey Red and L, that Michael Way was previously the A&R guy for Trey Red and signed the monochrome set and everything but the girl and Kevin Coyne, Alison Garza, Felt, etc., many successful acts. He left for a time for the mm. adventure with the Warner Brothers and started Blanco Negro, and then he came back to Trey Red Fold and started L Records, and you were very much part of that. Mm. So the first, the first record on L mm -hmm. came out, yeah, and what kind of response did it get? Um, it got actually very, very, very good response. And at the time, in our naivety, again, we thought it was absolutely normal that when you had a record out or a single out, it would be a single of the week or an album of the month, and it would be in sounds, in the record mirror, in the NME, <laughs> in all these things. That's, yeah, that's what they do, and uh, which, to be honest, completely... Uh, wrong way of asserting things. We didn't realize, I think, at the time that uh, we had been provided with that kind of springboard and it would be very difficult, and that this type of springboard, particularly in England, is not one that you can bounce on indefinitely. There's a moment when you really have to, to, to jump higher, and I think that's one little mistake we did there. And, and, but the, the reaction, I mean, critically was, was quite remarkable. Um, yeah, really quite remarkable indeed. I mean, in terms of, of sales, I mean, you know as well as I do that L Records was not exactly the most commercially successful label of its time. But I think that within L Records, these uh, appointments within us actually did reasonably well. And also, very importantly, I think it was one of the records that caught the attention of people abroad, and particularly in Japan, yes. together with uh, Roll Bastard, uh, King of Luxembourg, and then later the Red Shoes. I think that these three records were really very important for the Japanese, um, what they call the Shibuya K, uh, the, the young guys and young girls from Shibuya, to take us under, uh, uh, under their protection almost and, and provide us with an extraordinary outlet that in many ways helped us to, to get through some pretty difficult years back home. And uh, so the response, that, that was in the way very, very important to, 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 to do that. Um, and and it was also you know, the start of three years, I believe, of incredibly uh, active and actually fecund time for, for L Records because um, I seem to be in the studio almost every week that, in, that, in those three years. I mean, it was certainly the first two years it seemed to be every week. There was always something to do either for, for myself because we, we were releasing records like there was no tomorrow. Here's a single. It's very prolif prolific, L, yeah. Very. And there's a single, and the single is not on the album. Yeah. And, uh, and we need a B-side, and we need actually three B-sides, please. And then could you write a few songs for this? And then uh, Mike came up with the idea of doing the Red Shoes with Anthony Adverse and yes. gave that to me, so I had to write and arrange the album and work again with Richard Preston as a producer. And I did some, some things as well for Simon's second album. I worked with Kevin Wright on Metro Land. We did some things with, with Jessica Griffin with The Would Be Goods. Uh, it, it, was, it was insane in terms of uh, the, the activity. It was also absolutely wonderful. Um, maybe we were a bit hyperactive, I don't know, like well, Mike, children on Tartar Mike, Mike is hyperactive, full <laughs> stop. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know what your perception of it would be, but I think maybe yeah. people were a bit puzzled by the fact that these guys could put out all these records. Yes. And it was, um, you know, even labels like, you know, like Rough Trade wouldn't have done that. But it was just this idea, we've got to keep them coming. We've got to amaze people by how creative we are, how colourful we are. And, and, and this at the time when, honestly, the type of thing we were doing, and on a shoestring, really, we were not working with big budgets. We mm. couldn't because the records were not selling enough, to be honest. Um, the, the type of things we were doing were completely, went completely against the grain of what the musical scene was at the time, certainly in England. And there was actually quite a backlash after an initial springboard had been provided uh, from some of the bigger uh, uh, music papers, which at the time were still hugely influential, far more than they are today. And we suffered a huge backlash for completely the wrong reasons. Uh, we were seen as, uh, 
you know, like middle class kids having fun with their daddy's monies and, and totally escapist, which I suppose we were up to a point. But whereas I think, when I think, look back on it, what I think, and but one of the things I think that people still, and actually probably more people are interested in L now than they were at the time, is that, yes, it was a, 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 it was a strange label which had, on one hand, genuine songwriters. Uh, if you think of people like, you know, Nick Curry, uh, I, I would put myself in there, and Kevin Wright, certainly. Uh, people were genuine songwriters, uh, an incredible crew of, of studio musicians, some very fine singers. So musically, the quality was there. The image was there as well, slightly exotic, a bit different. But it was all done within almost, with almost a punk spirit. Well, I think, I think one of the reasons why Elle wasn't more successful was... As you're saying, to start with, the press was great. Mm. It was a certain profile. People talked about L because it was different. But the one thing L never really got was any decent radio play. And that's what you really need to sell records, especially, especially mm. melodic records. You need radio play. And there are many reasons for that. I suppose the obvious reason is that possibly the records weren't quality-wise, in terms of the recordings, quite good enough for Radio 1. I think they, they, they certainly went against the grain. If you listen back to them, they're actually very beautiful to listen to and they, they, they haven't aged at all. If you compare them, though, to the very, very heavily produced music of that time... That's the thing. I mean, it's the same thing you were talking about everything com about the girl. Compare what Ben and Tracy were doing when they were on, on Cherry Red yes. and the Marine Girls album and Ben's solo albums and the first Everything But The Girl single and compare that with what they did, uh, uh, what was first his name? Album, the first album, Eden. Yeah. This is the quantum leap in terms of production values. But this being said, I think that in many ways what they did for Cherry Red... Has Robert, Robin Miller. Robin yeah. Miller, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, who was really at the top of his game at the time yeah. and was one of the most sought-after producers of, of that particular era. Well, I think that when you listen to, to Eden, which is still a marvellous record with a couple of absolutely stunning songs, it sounds very much of its time. If you listen to Royal Bastard today, it could have been recorded actually today. Yeah. It is far more timeless, um, maybe because of the lack of means, the fact that you have to work within limitations. Um, and, and which is something I, I think we can be quite proud of, but probably did at a disservice at the time, because there were some actually very, very commercial records in that. One of which, I, I think, for example, I'm not talking about one of mine here, but when Bad Jim's Fancy Dress did Curry Crazy, and Richard Preston, did, 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 we did the playback together. I was absolutely convinced this was going to be a number one hit. It was yeah. absolutely yeah. monstrous. But again, it was too, too much fun. I don't know, there was a certain lightness, certain amateurism about it, which was very popular, which is, now would make it popular. But we had gone past that age or, you know, of bands like The Slits or the pop group or Pig Bag, where this was looked on as, as a good thing. People had moved on from there. It was all guitar a, a, bands. A, a, and L was out of time. Yeah. And Michael was timeless. always been out of time, really. Yeah. 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 I think timeless is the, uh, you yeah. know, without, you know, one, and I think you know, Mike for that is, is a perfect example of the timeless person. Uh, I, another thing, for example, look, everybody's talking about the uh, Duckworth Lewis method, you know, the album that Neil Hen of the Divine Committee has done, yeah. talking the first album ever done about cricket. That's not true. Our records were there first with It's a Beautiful yeah. Game by the Cavaliers. But again, it was done later. The Red yeah. Shoes, before Kate Bush did it, we were there. Yeah. there. So many of the ideas, when you look at the Saint-Étienne sleeves, you can see where it comes from. Yes. Um, and, and actually, well, there's, there's all the, the people who sample our music as well. You can realize that there was all this, it was like a, a laboratory of, of ideas with everybody trying to egg on, egg on each other and, and Michael with, in the role of you know, Merlin the sorcerer <laughs> trying to, to knock everybody into shape and to, to, to send his troops to battles. Uh, and once it was done, as soon as the record was done, oh, let's have another one, let's not even talk about the way it is done, it's gone, it's the past, let's have something new, which is exhausting. But, you know, it didn't quite work, but um, I think that the, 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 the legacy, to use a very big, big word... Well, you, you mentioned word, is, Japan is there. earlier, and yeah. um, there's uh, artists like yeah. Pizzacaso 5, yeah. um, Cornelius, who do actually credit L with, with uh, yeah. influence there. Tomate as well was another one. I mean, they're, 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 there's, it's quite remarkable, uh, even, even now, that uh, I, I could see that because I still go from Japan from time to time to Japan from time to time. Uh, last time I was there was two years ago. And 
Um, I'm also in correspondence, you know, through the usual uh, internet networks uh, with a great number of Japanese fans or fellow musicians. And it's what is really quite interesting is that the, uh, the age group hasn't really changed. So we are still, I say we, because I always tend to say we when talk about people who were with Al. Yeah. Um, it's still the, the 18 to, to 25 and to 30 are still very much coming to us, which is actually a lovely feeling, I have to say, uh, without having you know, um, lost the, the older ones. But there, there are, I discovered that there were a whole lot of discussion groups about their records, you know, teenagers discussing our stuff on their boards, which is really quite, quite strange, really. Um, and it had, it had a huge impact. Uh, I think partly the, 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 it's the image, the, the, this, this idea of mixing a very eccentric type of music with also a very eccentric and very English uh, type of uh, presentation, which you know, takes a biscuit because Mark, Mike is from Cornwall, I'm from Normandy, <laughs> Nick is from Scotland. Um, Simon is, I think, the proper, you know, yeah. I mean, Richard Preston was so important. Uh, his mother comes from the West Indies and his father uh, is, is an Englishman, was an Englishman who came from Alsace. Uh, so it was very, very uh, cosmopolitan, shall we say. Um, but th th this idea of Englishness, they're absolutely they're completely bought into it. Maybe it takes a foreigner to be English, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's so, so mm. quickly look at your career on, on the record side. So after a point with Venus, mm. you had Ivory Tower and yeah. then Yuri Gagarin. Yeah, it was a really weird, weird, really weird time because after, after uh, we did a point with Venus, I tried to, 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 to be as cut to the facts as quickly as possible. I actually recorded another album. Uh, which was never released, and um, uh, for the best of reasons, because it would have been, it would have actually, I realized afterwards, it would have create, caused a great deal of harm. And I think as well, uh, because Appointment with Venus had had a decent response, shall we say, critically, and also was attracted some attention, and the sales actually were not that bad. Um, and then there had been this, this single, You Marry You, which could have been a hit single, uh, that was the Brian Wilson song, wasn't no, it? No, no, it's, it's mine. It's your <laughs> song. There was a, it's oh, my okay. song. Oh, okay. and, uh, and which was released after Appointment with Venus. Right. And, and which was a very, very commercial song, uh, and um, which is still played on, on, on the radio, is on a few playlists here and there, and really had the potential t to be at least an independent hit uh, at the time. Did reasonably well, but suddenly in Japan, if I remember well, it actually was top of the import charts, the, the 12 inch at right. the time. So it really had a, an impact there. And the second album I, I, I recorded, we, f we used actually a great deal of the songs later on, either as B-sides or in the later albums. But we realized that, uh, I think it was probably Michael at the time, I'm not sure, that it was not the correct album. Michael had heard many other demos of mine and thought I had a great, well, there was a great pop album in there. And so we went back in the studio and did Ivory Tower which again in Japan was an important record and which I think was probably the apex of of our records which is 1987 when we toured there as well uh, with Nick Wazolowski of the Monochrome set on drums with uh, Martin Bates of Alice and Gaza playing bass and singing yeah. backing vocals. This is a famous legendary tour this. It was. I think we were absolutely rubbish in terms of our, our excellence, well, Dean Brodrick on keyboard, I should never forget Dean Brodrick because he played on almost every single L record ever released. Um, and when I say rubbish, we had very little time to rehearse. We actually yeah. rehearsed down the road from, from, from my place in Nomis, uh, in West London. And I think we had something like four or five sessions. Uh -huh. And we were supposed to play my set, uh, Julius set, that's Anthony Adversus set, uh, set, and the King of Luxembourg set. And it was the same band for all three sets. So we yes. had to memorize something like 45 songs in three days. So it was a bit chaotic, but the atmosphere at those gigs was such that it just carried us through and there were actually some, some rather marvelous and very emotional moments. I mean, it was, it was an extraordinary. Yeah. And there's one thing I, you know, I, I really, I'm, I'm, uh, that I'm, I'm so um, anxious to see one day uh, is that one night was filmed by Derek Jarman. I know, and, and Simon Turner claims to have these tapes. Yes, and, and he can't find them. And he can't find them. Yeah. And um, which is because I, I remember 
Derek being there with yeah. his, his you know, handheld 16mm cam camera and actually capturing my most embarrassing moment on stage um, uh, during <laughs> a, a, a spinal tap moment uh, when Simon was playing and for some reason we had decided to uh, dress as ninjas for the evening, <laughs> don't ask me. And we had, we I were. Bet it was Mike's idea. Wasn't no, it, it was. Right? I think it was Nick Vesalowski okay. and, and myself. Okay. And um, but we were all dressed as ninjas. And, and Simon, I can't remember what he was. It was dressed at. And I was playing the acoustic guitar on the right side of the stage on a on a stool as you do. And very slowly, I felt myself falling backwards. And Derek was filming me at the moment, and I literally couldn't get up. Exactly like. Uh, in the spinal scene, spinal tap scene, except that there was no roadie to put me back up on my feet, so I had to finish the song literally playing like <laughs> this. And it's it's all on film. I would like to see it one yeah. day, yeah. <laughs> but unfortunately, Simon can't uh, can't locate yeah. the, the tapes. That's that's really uh, quite a real pity. So, L kind of came to a natural end. Yeah. And you went on and recorded two more albums for Japan only released, didn't you? Yeah, uh, I, I, for a while I was, I, I went into journalism. This is actually when I started journalism. Okay. And I, I never stopped write, write, writing songs. But after Elle's demise and the, the release of the album Yuri Gagarin, um, I, I thought, well, I, I've got to carry on, but also I've got to, to earn a living. And I started to do that. But I was, I had kept in touch uh, particularly with um, Keigo Yamada of Flipper's Guitar, which was one right. of these, which was probably the most popular boys band in Japan at the time, who were huge fans of L Records and, and of myself. And they got in touch with me, and I, I think they went to, they were working on, in, in London as well on one of their, um, uh, one of their own records. Uh, we met up, and they said, well, we are about to start our, our own label within uh, Polystar, which was, you know, I would say a reasonable medium size, size, yeah, reasonable size yeah. company. And this label is going to be called Trattoria, would you like to be on it? And I thought, that's absolutely wonderful, there's going to be an outlet for, for the new songs and for, for new albums. And it happened so very naturally, and they provided me with a very generous advance for, for the Japanese rights to the albums. And that enabled me to go into the studio and to record First of all, an album, quite experimental album called Rainfall, but which, believe it or not, is the, the best-selling album of my career. Hmm. So maybe it goes to show. And and then uh, another album. I, I actually released quite quite a few quite a few albums with them, interspersed with uh, regular visits to Japan tours. Um, so it it helped to keep me afloat, uh, musically speaking, until that time when I got back in touch with labels in Britain which was a, a small label with a very interesting uh, stable of artists called uh, Humbug. <laughs> um, I won't talk too Kevin much about Carl, it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, which but was a they, very strange... They had a great stable, actually. The stable was actually Captain pretty... Sensible, Martin Newell. Yes. Some good people there. There were some very good people. TV Smith was, was there, right, yeah, was there yeah. as well. And there were some... Colin Lloyd Tucker as well was, was right, there, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah. So the idea was to get a, a stable of so-called what, what Kevin Crace who was at the head of the head of the yeah. label at the time thought were classic songwriters. Yeah. So um, and which is how I came across Martin Newell for the first time. And you know, thank you, Kevin, for that because that was an absolutely pivotal moment. Yeah. In so in so many ways. And Martin's still releasing on Cherry Red. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And um, but Hamburg so provided me with a home in England, and there was a company called WMD as well in France provided me with a home as well. And things really starting speeding up at that time really, really quickly. Um, because I, I met Bertrand Burgala, uh, who is now, I mean, he's certainly one of the best known producers of popular music uh, in France. Um, an absolutely extraordinary musician whom I met in 1993. We recorded an album together called Sunshine, which was later re-released actually yeah. on, on through Cherry yeah. Red. And, and 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 it was it it was the most prolific probably time I've ever had between uh, 91 I would say and and 1999. It was absolutely crazy. I think I did I wasn't something like over 20 albums during that mm. period, which is colossal. Yeah. Because yeah. it's it as you know it's. Uh, through Hamburg, I met with Martin Newell. For Martin Newell, I met with, with Dave Gregory of XTC. Dave became uh, a regular on the sessions on, on my own albums. And 
it became all very incestuous. Did you, pr did you produce the Off-White album? I produced the Off-White album, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, I, I, I arranged and, and produced it for, for Martin. Yeah. I had a, it was a very, very strange experience in terms of how we had to do the record because we had absolutely no money. And uh, we were working with um, Vic Carey at Chiswick Ridge Studio, uh, a legendary man, the man who uh, recorded Young, Gifted and Black. Yes, right, indeed. Right. Uh, worked. I think he worked on um, uh, Satanic Majesty's request as well. So he was never short of a story or two, you know, to entertain us when he was smoking a cigar at the local Georgian <laughs> Dragon, drinking yeah. his pint. It was great, great, great fun. So we toured, actually. We did the tour from hell in the, the former Eastern Germany with Martin Ewell and, and Dev Gregory. There was lots of things were happening. And at the same time, people were, were realizing that I, I could also be hired on as, a, as an arranger because I... I had done quite a, quite a few arrangements for L. Then I had worked with some Japanese artists, and then some people from England uh, and, and from the continent started to ask me to, to provide orchestral arrangements or brass arrangements or string arrangements. Yeah. So suddenly I gave, became extremely, extremely busy. Because you started to work with people like PJ Proby, didn't you? Well, I did a little bit of work. It was nothing much with PJ Proby. I was more, it was more thanks to Bertrand Burgala that I got on that okay. gig. Uh, I, I worked with Mathilde Santing. Uh, and that was for, through Izumi Kobayashi, a, a Japanese friend who was working, who was Mathilde Santing's pianist at the time. And I got to, to write the arrangements, I think, of uh, three songs on, uh, uh, on one of her albums. So it's, it worked, and by word of mouth, people heard that I could do this and I could do that. And I, I don't know, it's, it, 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 it felt absolutely natural. And I, I rejoined, so to speak, the indie world. Yeah. After having, you know, having been part of it, I would say between '86 to '90 to '89, and then it started again, and and you know, up up till now, where I'm probably busier than ever and re releasing records at the great rate of knots, and so. Uh, but in nineteen, I think in two thousand and four, yeah, you, you actually had a self-funded record, didn't you? Well, y yes, so, so to speak. You raised the money on the internet. Yeah, I I, I I thought that because I I had come to I I. I I worked with, with Japan for a while uh, and, and, and with a very, very, very good relationship with them, which enabled me to do things that, honestly, no other label would have enabled me to do. Um, I did probably one of the records I'm, I'm the most pleased with, uh, with my long-time collaborator, Danny Manners. We worked for six months on what is uh, an orchestral album. Uh, which is certainly I mean, very, very ambitious album, but don't think of um, Deep Purple with the London Philharmonic. It's actually a proper, I think, um, orchest orchestrated pop album, um, which actually caused me a great deal of disappointment where it fell completely on deaf ears in England, not elsewhere, not elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, because I thought it would, would, could maybe provide people with a key into the music I was doing and it didn't quite happen. I recorded an album of classical or rather contemporary classic contemporary music melodies by Francis Poulenc, all these things. I also worked with Michael again, for example, at the end of uh, the 20th century uh, for the Siesta label, doing three albums with them. This is a Spanish label, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, Spanish yeah. label through, uh, through, through Reverie, uh, international songs for the Jet Set and Zap the World and Algebra Spaghetti, Simultaneous Ice Cream. It, absolutely crazy. And with Richard yeah. Preston again. So yeah. the old team got together, but a new team, so to speak, got, got as well. Um, uh, people that I wanted to work with for, you know, for a while, Sean O'Hagan of the High Lammers, we got to know each other, uh, Carol Cochlan as well of Micro Disney and the Fatima Mansions, people, so uh, a family recomposed itself and, and it expanded itself and has kept expanding since then and, and, and in 2004 it had come to a point where I thought I don't think that record labels, with my, or my apologies, Ian, I don't think record labels understand what's happening in terms of, of the music and how it's being shared, recorded, bought and given away. And uh, I thought, well, I don't think I can work with a classical, with an, a classical label set up anymore because I don't think that the kind of investment that I need for, to do my records, which rely you know, on outside forces, sometimes quite big ones, I need you know, recent, decent budgets in an age where people are expected to do records in their bedrooms for absolutely no money. Um, and, okay, I work in a studio at the French place called Regal Lane Studios with my friend Ken Brake most of the time. But still, you know, people have got to be paid. And so I decided, okay, let's try an experiment. 
I had started my website, I think, in 1997, pretty early on, actually. It is, yeah. And um, there was quite a bit of traffic and lively message board. And I realized there were a lot of people who were interested in not only what I had done, but also what I was doing. And so it was a means to, to get in touch with them and sometimes to get the records to them, online shop and all these sort of things. And I thought, well, actually, why don't I ask fans to come to my help and subsidize the record. If I get enough subscriptions for, for this record, I'll have the money not only to record it, but also to manufacture it. I won't ask them more money than they would normally pay for one of their uh, foreign albums. Uh, they will get something special with it. I, I, re I did a, a limited edition uh, EP, okay. each, each of which was signed and yeah. so forth, yeah. of six songs which have appeared absolutely nowhere else theirs and theirs only, only for the subscribers. And so you're it, charging like fifteen pounds or something where you I was uh, charging less than that. I was charging yeah. I think twelve pounds for, for the album. And how many actually how many actually subscribed? Uh, in the end we were it was in the low hundreds, but you know we were I the first print run went almost entirely to the uh, to the to the subscribers. Right, so we yeah. talk there was there were two waves. There were the, the angels who all have their name on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the album. Right, yeah. And these were those who kick-started, just gave us the money to get started, the first 100. Yeah. So these guys have got their names actually were yeah. inside the record. And I think in total we had something like 900, something like that, which in, in these days uh, I've been told is colossal. That's uh, extremely good, yeah. 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 So, yeah, because the first print run was 1,000, and yeah. I, I probably gave away uh, 100, and so, yeah. yeah, so that's about 900 in total. Yeah. And then afterwards, the, you know, the record I found, then I went and found distributors, organized this digital distribution and all these things. Um, yeah. So, and, and I realized, you know, it can be done. Um, the one thing that is, was, was a little bit difficult was to deal with the, you know, the press, the media, uh, at the beginning was a little bit delicate <laughs> because it's very difficult to blow your own trumpet um, very easy to blow somebody else's yeah. so to speak yeah. but um, I couldn't you know I couldn't fancy myself um, writing by the way this is a, a remarkable release by this genius songwriter <laughs> and you, know, you can't do that so I, I, I trusted the word of mouth and actually yeah. it, it worked and it enabled me to start a relationship for example with an American distributor Dala I'm sure you know, and um, with whom I'm still working. So I managed to put in place, you know, I, I found a French distributor, I found a German distributor, a Swede a distributor in, in Scandinavia. And uh, in, the, in the long term, actually, this, this has enabled me to completely relaunch my career, so to speak, in a, in a completely different way, and which is now, like most people, um, totally get towards you know, new means of, of distribution yeah. on one hand, but also sticking to what I would call the uh, handicraft organic CD market, which is something that people who are into my music, which you would call, I don't know how it's categorized these days, alt pop, something like that, um, tend to, they tend to be the people who today are, st are still into discovering albums, records, pieces of work, with the sequencing, not just the track that you've heard. They're, they're real fans, yeah. They're real fans. Yeah. I mean, the bond is extraordinarily strong and, and, and I mean, stronger than ever. Um, and, yeah. I just want to look at your, mm. sorry to interrupt, but we're, sorry. Uh, time is, is sorry, sorry. limited. Mm. Um, so at that time also, this time also, when you, 2004, your writing career was going to take off, wasn't it? Yes. And I think you had your first book published shortly after that? Yeah, I was, I started, I mean, I had been working as a journalist yes. uh, for a number of, I mean, first of all, I worked at the BBC World Service, then I, I, I worked, but through sheer coincidence, I started working for France Football, which is, very, you know, quite important French football magazine, you know, European Footballer of the Year. That's us. So yes. it is. It is. It is a big comic, as Martin Newell would say. <laughs> uh, and then I started to work for the polit for political magazine. And some of the pieces that I wrote for that political mag magazine attracted the publisher Fayard, who asked me to write what was basically a, a critique of uh, New Labour. You know, it goes in all directions, I'm afraid. Uh, which was published in 2006 and which predicted the meltdown of the financial market. Mm. And um, yes, so. <laughs> And uh, so my Cassandra moment, and uh, which had you know some success in France, but I, I that was my only foray into political journalism. I, I, I stopped two years ago 
to uh, to go back to the things I I love the most, which are music one and and football second. Because you have a, you have a book mm -hmm. which I hold the cover up here, so we can. It's catch, very kind of you. Um, which is coming out fairly shortly. 21st of August. Which is very topical because this yes. man here, of course, has, his, has the film out, Looking for Eric, yes. Ken Loach's film. Purely coincidental. Right. Purely coincidental because the, the, I started working on the book three years ago. Um, the subject was actually... Um, it was actually I was talking to uh, my agent, my literary agent, uh, in, in a tapas bar. And we were thinking, what should be your first book in English? And he said, I've got an idea. Cantona, and I thought, oh, that's a great idea. I'd love to do that. And so um, that was about three years ago. And at the time, I had no idea that Ken Loach was, or that Eric Cantona himself was about to contact Ken Loach with the idea for the film. Yes. I think they actually started a little bit after us, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, it's a great coincidence. And, you know, I'm obviously. Have you, have you had much contact with Cantona? With Cantona himself, on, only on three occasions, because that was not an, it's not an autobiography. I've yes, been in I touch see. with, um, with a, uh, I think we did the, the counts of it, something like over 200 people, which is a lot, uh, who have been part of Cantona's yes. life and career. Um, and uh, uh, I got in touch. I wanted to him to know that I was writing the book. I wanted, to, I wanted him to know from which perspective I was writing the book. And then I wanted him to remind him that I was writing the book. So I managed finally to, to see him in London last year and um, to explain, try and explain what I was doing, that I was, you know, this, this was the chap that had the faxes you had got and I knew he had read them. This is me. Yes. I'm, I'm the burglar who's just been in your house and <laughs> uh, not that I've stolen anything. And uh, which has, who has come with this, I mean, quite, it's a huge, it's a huge book, 140,000 words. Which is a great deal. You know, in the film, mm. you know, I've only ever seen him play on the football pitch, but in the film, he really comes across almost like an artist. I mean, by an artist, I mean a musician or mm. a painter. And the way he describes, um, there's this the sequence in the film where he's asked, What was your best goal? And he wants to talk about not his best goal, but his best move. Mm. And the way he talks about it, it's just like an artist. Yeah. It's not really like a footballer. He must be a fascinating man. He is, I think he's a, he's, he's, he's a very contradictory, paradoxical, fascinating uh, man. He's both, uh, he's got areas where he's very shallow, I think, and he's got areas where he's actually got, there's a great profundity to the man, so to speak, to use very, in terms which actually you should maybe use for a human being. Uh, it's all, the, all, that, all that together. And... Uh, the thing is that when people have talked about him, it generally has to be to portray him either as an angel or a demon, in very, very strong terms, very contrasted terms. And I thought, no, we should try to look at the, the wholeness of Eric and, and try and see what is there, not behind the legend, let's, you know, why should we be uh, wearing ourselves with trying to debunk myths and things like that, but to actually try and understand what made these legends become legends. And, and, and to be fairer to him in one way, but also to be critical when, needed, when it needed to be, and to do a proper, proper job on him. So why do you think he became a legend? He became a legend because he was, and I'm quoting Alex Ferguson for that, he was the right man in the right club at the right time. There's the Cantona before England, and the Cantona before England is, is, is a superb footballer who has been in trouble with the French football authorities, who doesn't fit in, but is also a magnificent player that nobody quite knows what to do with except the guys who are in charge of the national team who are, uh, in his case, Michel Platini. Yes. And, uh, and who knew, with the French national team, people forget that Cantona never had a problem. He was never sent off. He was a hard worker and so forth. Um, but the primes lay somewhere else, and you know, it would take us too long. I mean, we, we can talk around <laughs> a pint of beer afterwards if you wish about that, but he didn't fit in, and, and in a way... The, the, the best thing that happened to him was in a way the most terrible thing that could happen to him when he announced his retirement for French football in, in 1991 and was suddenly found himself in a crazy situation where he had to pay back a huge contract for, to the club that owed him and in the end found himself, which I tell the story um, uh, of how he f found himself at Sheffield Wednesday, nearly went to Japan, quite extraordinarily enough, then went to Leeds and then finally after establishing himself after a fashion at Leeds 
came to Manchester United. Yeah. And where it became, you know, where Eric Cantona became Cantona. And he didn't become Eric Cantona immediately, he became Cantona probably about, in, 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 I think, in the second season. Um, and this is England made. English football made Eric Cantona just as much as Eric Cantona made English football become what it is now, for better and for worse. Uh, yeah. For better because without, I think, an Eric Cantona, you wouldn't have had a Dennis Bergkamp coming in. Uh, a Jürgen Klinsmann, yeah. a Gianluca Vialli, a, a Zola, and all these people. I mean, he showed that it was possible to have a flair player, who foreign flair player, he was the first one, mm. who didn't come from Scandinavia. You know, there had been others, of course, from Scandinavia. Um, but, on the, and there, there had been maybe Osvaldo Ardiles, but it was not the player quite in the same mould. But this first time he showed people from the Latin country can come and, and, and do this. And, yeah. and, and also he was the first superstar and probably he's probably the biggest mega star that the Premier League has ever produced and I think much bigger than Ronaldo in many ways I think the, in terms of the aura of the man and even the shirt sales when you meet him mm -hmm. does he have that aura yeah uh, I, I I was quite struck actually by one of this is the deportment everybody had told me other you see you see the way he holds himself yes. the, he's so straight backed and he's yeah. a very imposing man he's six foot two yeah. And very muscular. Did he have his collar turned up when you mentioned No, he was actually wearing a very, very elegant, uh, a very elegant uh, suit uh, and um, white shirt and, and very, very, very nice tie, actually. Yeah. And sport, sporting a quite very nicely trimmed beard. Very much a sort of the uh, dark, tenebrous gentleman. Uh, he wanted to project that image. There's an awful lot about it, which is projection and what people want to see of him and in him. Yeah. I think that goes with it. And yes, he, he, does, he does fill the room. Uh, and not just because it is Eric Cantona, he has a real presence uh, 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 about him. I know you're also quite friendly with Arsene Wenger. Yes, yeah, it's a completely different relationship because yeah. Eric Cantona is not somebody I know. I mean, I know yes. him, I think, I know a lot about him now. From and I think, I'm, book, yeah. and I think people are going, hopefully, to, to learn to know him better through the book. But Arsene Wenger is completely different. Is uh, I've, I've been, I think, uh, I've seen every single... Arsenal home game for, whew, gosh, a long time. Yeah. So the whole Wenger era and a lot of the away games as well. And because I was working, was, I'm a Frenchman working in England, uh, and I was for a while the only French correspondent um, uh, actually working in, in, in England, based in England, working as regularly and that, um, with maybe a friend from, from L'Equipe, sorry. And so therefore Arsene Wenger um, was much keener to speak uh, to a countryman, I suppose, who had an approach which was a little bit more delicate, maybe, but also sometimes more questioning uh, than we had with the British press. And so, I, I th through fast football, I, I got to meet him quite regularly, up to the point I would never call Arsene Wenger a friend because I don't think that you can have a friend who earns hundred times what you earn or something like that. <laughs> I think no, I think it really puts a, a barrier. Yeah. But he, yeah. I, I'm very friendly with him. I'm, I'm, f I'm much more close to, to Gerard Houillet, for example, because Gerard is now out of the management game. And, and I, I, I will talk to Gerard Houillet from, from time to time on, on a more friendly basis. But Arsene Wenger has become, I think, a very, I hope, trusting relationship. Um, and I get to, yeah, to see him quite regularly. Um, for, I mean, see, it's an absolutely a fascinating chance, always. I mean, it's some, always something I look forward to. See, the impression I get, again, never, never having mm. met him, is that also he has a strong artistic quality. I think that there is a, an element... I, I think the, f the first thing I noticed when I, when I met him, which actually struck some, some people have a very strange um, thing to say, is that I, the first thing I saw when I, we, I first had a one-to-one -one interview with him it was, was his hands. And they were like a pianist's hands. They were not at mm. all like a footballer's hands. Ah. And I was really struck by, by the shape of the fingers and also the, the, the elegance of, you know, they really reminded me of a pianist's hands. And there is something of, yes, I mean, there is certainly in him a, a desire for, for expression on the football pitch, which, is, which has a kind of, it's, it has a moral and an artistic dimension to it, which is why people who, who defend Wenger, like me, uh, sometimes defend him beyond the point where we should be defending him because he's made like everybody has made wrong decisions. And, but also he has, I can't think, maybe Thomas Schaaf with Werder Bremen 
is one other example. Uh, but people who have a certain idea of football in which morality and aesthetics are, are conjoined. This is not the kind of words that you normally find associated in, in, in football. There are loads of coaches who, who, who love beautiful football. I mean, who is sitting, for example, Alex Ferguson, who is also a manager that I've had a chance to interview in, and somebody I, I have a lot of time for. And, but you don't quite get the absoluteness. I think Arsene has really got something in him which is a, a burning faith, a very romantic attachment to a certain idea of football, he's, and he's going to prove it's right. For me, he's somehow trying to, like an artist, he strives for perfection. Yep. And I think that's part of his frustration, is it? He's striving for perfection, but he has to rely on footballers to provide it, which is, isn't always easy. No, uh, the thing is that he, he strives for perfection, and the, uh, for him it's the perfection in improvisation. Because we've talked, touched on that very often, because you would have, for example, a manager like uh, Valery Lobanovsky, who was striving for perfection with Dynamo Kiev, uh, and, and, and with the Russian team. And, 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 and Lobanovsky was working on perfection as, this is a template, my players are going to replicate exactly this and exactly that. I'm going to drill them to such an extent they won't even have to think to know where the, 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 the next teammate is, you know, which is uh, the, the, this fabulous goal, one of my all-time fabulous goals, which is uh, in, in the European Cup, Winners' Cup final against... Uh, uh, who was that again? I have forgotten. This is absolutely dreadful. I can see this movement of the white ghosts, every single one of them pinging the ball about without looking where they're pinging the right, ball. Yeah. And it's just sublime. It's, it's, yeah. It is art. It is really football as art, as a collective art. But that's drilling. Arsene is different. When he's working, he's working on the technique of the players. He's working on movements, of course, and sometimes on defense, not often enough, maybe. But he's also working on the understanding between each player yes. and trusting them to fight exactly the right solution at the right time, it gives them the freedom to improvise within a very loose structure, very loose canvas. So is a, that kind of painter is more like a director than, than, than a painter. Is a director who will say to his actors, you can improvise your lines, but it will still be directed by Arsene Wenger at the end. Yeah. A little bit like a producer of a record, maybe, or a songwriter, or something. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. or yes, or uh, a band leader, a jazz band yes, leader. Yeah. He would be very much a jazz. He would be a okay. jazzer rather than a classical, yeah. you know, composer who wants that note exactly. He would say, okay, you can go a bit wild on this one, but you know, please play the course to start with. <laughs> play the tune at least, you know, at least once. Okay, Louis, stroke Philippe. Thanks very much for coming in. I'm going to show again your book, Cantona, the Rebel Who Would Be King. That's out very shortly. And uh, this, is, this is just a, a mock-up. It's not the actual book. The no, actual the book, book is, is much a, thicker than a, that. A, a, a very good tone. <laughs> and then you have, many, you have many CDs available. Yes. Um, I think the best of is still available, which is on L Stroke Cherry Red and some of the original albums. So if something in you has been stimulated by this program, do go along and uh, search out on Amazon or somewhere else uh, some of the Louis albums. Thank you again. Thank you again. And thank you for watching Cherry Red TV, and I hope we see you again soon. Goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.